I am very excited to be here. I feel very privileged to be able to come out to Paris and have already had a fantastic time in this city. It's just a beautiful place. Now, um, I'm excited because I get to talk to you guys uh, in a format that's a little different from what I'm used to. I'm going to talk about why I made salt, uh, but I'm going to be able to talk about it in more of the perspective of what are the philosophies behind that, thing, that which was made and what was the motivation. So, early on in my development of salt, my primary motivation came from the fact that things in the world of managing infrastructures is dramatically different from what it used to be. It used to be that what we worked with was a lot of big point solutions. What we worked with was uh, that you'd have a stack of a bunch of proprietary pieces that you layer on top of each other, and that there weren't very many organizations out there that were doing things at really massive scale. But the difference now is that we've got a lot of infrastructures that are doing things at scale, and we've got a lot of companies that are really worried about being able to do things with respect to starting small and growing, but also being able to unify a lot of their functionality. And so, Instead of coming through and saying it's okay to have to install numerous different agents on all of my systems, instead of it being okay to say that we're managing our system via this conglomeration of a number of different uh, pieces, I felt as though a unified approach would make a lot more sense. And so if we're going to make a unified approach, I knew that I had to make that unified approach a little differently from normal. Normally, how somebody makes a unified approach is that they come out and they say, well, I've got this, this one agent, and I'm going to make it the agent that rules them all, and it becomes this horribly bloated thing. But I said, I think that there are a few principles that we can follow to make sure that we can achieve something that is very universally capable and is able to actually start dealing with the many aspects of managing an infrastructure. So the primary point that I wanted to push on when I began the project was speed. You cannot handle large numbers of systems unless everything down to the very lowest level is extremely fast and extremely performant. And that's one of the reasons why SALT, for instance, is still considered well, I shouldn't say considered, it's still benchmarks is dramatically faster at what it does than any, anything else that's out there. Now, the next thing that was really important is the fact that everybody's infrastructure is different. Now, just think about the many places or infrastructures or deployments that you've worked with. How often is it that you've gone from one company to another and things line up quite nicely with the way that they used to work? It isn't something that happens very often, or if ever. One size does not fit all. Next, there's an, there's an emerging concept that's been happening more with respect to the whole cloud movement. And that concept is to say that don't treat your servers as pets, treat them as cattle. Make all of your servers and all of your deployments disposable and don't babysit them. And then there's the idea of the snowflake servers, the ones that, you know, that guy who left four years ago set up, and all we know is that it still works and everybody's afraid to touch it. Now, unfortunately, in the real world, we have, despite how well we can set up a lot of servers to work as cattle, where we've got our apps running in disposable containers or virtual machines, et cetera, there's a limit. And so any management system needs to be able to span these different areas. It needs to be able to go communicate with Snowflake servers and discover what they, what they are. It needs to be able to take care of servers that need babysitting, and it needs to be able to dispose of systems and bring them down and bring them up. It also, I'm really sorry, you probably heard a ton of Heartbleed jokes and references today. But any management platform that you deploy should be able to solve unexpected problems. It should be able to deal with things as they come up. One of my favorite 
uh, references, or uh, well, we've got a lot of these, is how many people have come out and said that thanks to the fact that we have SALT deployed, we were able to mitigate every problem, every possible problem from heart bleed in just a few minutes. Uh, Wikimedia was one of them, we, but we've got a long list. Okay. And then finally, there's something fantastic about being able to look out at a deployment of servers and treat them all like a legion of your own personal minions. They need to be intelligent enough to do your bidding and exactly what your bidding is with no unexpected surprises. So, with these sorts of requirements in mind, how is it possible for us to accomplish this task of creating a, a, a management system? Now, the fundamental principle of automation in my mind is that it must be founded on the ability to communicate. Now that means the ability to communicate with and across the servers inside of your infrastructure. So, when we look at communication, it needs to come in a number of different forms, and that's everything from being able to blast commands out more or less willy-nilly, to do extremely complicated orchestration, but also to be able to use your management system as a cross or bi-directional communication bus. Now, that communication needs to be able to scale. Most of the communication systems that have been made in the past have been built upon the ideas of being of blasting out SSH commands to many, many systems and devices. But a truly asynchronous system was required to be able to handle the level of scale, which again is why uh, we've been able to put together software that works seamlessly and smoothly with many tens of thousands of servers and continues to scale well without having to revamp a lot of the fundamental design. Next, we need a way to communicate with systems that's normalized. We need to be able to look at a system that's a Red Hat system and a Debian system and talk to them in the same way. Or similarly, a system that's, I mean, to get a little more out there, I know we're talking about scale, so Windows doesn't come up that often, but it is a thorn in many of our sites. But you need to be able to communicate with a Windows system in a similar way that you communicate with a Linux system or a Unix system or a Mac system. And so we need a normalized library of routines that's able to translate functionality on a vast array of systems in a way that is standardized so that we can run one routine or one lookup and get the consistent, say, network information or disk usage information across all of, our, all of our systems. And then, of course, inside that is the cross-management idea. That it doesn't matter what platform your management throws at you, it doesn't matter what platform your new developer decided to deploy behind your back, you can manage anything. Finally, to truly build a management system that is properly flexible and can solve these sorts of problems, it has to be highly modular and layered. That again is why the SALT platform in and of itself has, honestly I lose count, I think we've got 18 different modulation points right now. Ways in which somebody can drop a module in to solve specific problems to their specific deployment. And then all of those module systems are opt-in, you don't need to use what you don't what you don't need. These sorts of concepts are the things that allow us to create a management system which is functional and, again, achieved what I'm talking about. Can work in many, many, many different types of locations, many different types of deployments, and many different types of companies and organizations. All right, so I want to take a few minutes and talk about the configuration management system. So configuration management is that next layer of automation. Sure, we've got communication. Sure, we've got the ability to send routines out. But it's very important that we can put together more complex automation routines 
which can set up systems but also have decision-based routines. Now, that means that configuration management is a lot of different things. Now, if you go out into the market and talk to people like market analysts, the word configuration management is one of the most convoluted things I've ever heard in my life. And they've got just this laundry list of a, of a billion different things that it could be. But so I want to break it down into some very fundamental needs that a configuration management system needs to accomplish for it to be useful in a wide array of settings. Fundamentally, I think that a configuration management system needs to be imperative in the way in which it executes. Now, before anybody hangs me on this one, wait till I get to the next slide because it'll make this more confusing if you're used to this argument. A configuration management system must execute in the order in which it is defined by the user, making it predictable. Making it so that what you do when you set up your automation routines is going to make sense when the system actually executes it. That that translation from your mind to activity is something which flows in, the way, in a way in which makes sense and again is predictable. So now that I've said that it needs to be imperative, a configuration management system, in my mind, must be declarative. Now, traditionally, there's this big argument about this. But again, that's why inside of SALT, we made an incredibly powerful declarative configuration management system where you can define relationships, where you can say that this routine that needs to be executed is directly related to this other routine over here. And then they need to have many different types of relationships which can be expressed. But on the same token, they need to be able to execute in a completely deterministic way and in a way which is highly predictable. So that as you walk through the automation routines, it is the same every time you execute it, regardless of where you execute it. But also predictable, easy to follow, and flexible enough that we can make simple relationships. I feel very strongly that configuration management needs to be data-driven. If you begin creating a platform which is fundamentally language-driven, you, you find yourself directly tied to that language as your means of deployment. This obviously can be very restrictive. Whereas if our automation platform is fundamentally data-driven, then we have a great deal more flexibility as to how it can grow and again, satisfy the fact that all deployments aren't the same. One size does not fit all. And then it needs to be autonomic. Now, this means that we need to be able to build something that can start, make, start to make different forking decisions based on what's going on in its surroundings. To pull this off, we are now starting to say that a configuration management system must be able to detect its surroundings. And by surroundings, we're not just talking about what's happening on that server during its configuration management run. We're talking about what's going on elsewhere inside of your given environment. And speaking of environments, it needs to work anywhere. It needs to work in a tech startup's new idea, and it needs to work in a 200-year-old bank. Finally, it's very important that these automation tools play well with other systems. Again, when we go and we look at an infrastructure, there's always a bunch of routines, systems, demons, platform, heaven knows, whatever you want to call them. They're all out there and already running. And so a truly good automation platform will be able to cleanly integrate with everything else that is already out there. 
Finally, let me talk a little bit about the event-driven aspect. When we're building automation, we need to build it in such a way that as events occur inside of an infrastructure, those events are things that we can respond to. And yes, that is a thorium-based molten salt nuclear reactor model. We need to be able to respond or react to events. Now, the ability to react to events means that whenever something happens in our infrastructure, we are able to hook back into all these other things that we've been talking about, the automation systems, the configuration management systems, as well as these management libraries, to say that a situation occurred, therefore, discover more about what the situation is and execute directly upon it. That begins to also mean that we need to start working with clouds and cloud infrastructures as much as that word has been aggressively overused. And when I say play with any cloud, I don't mean play with Amazon and Rackspace and yay, that's any cloud. I mean an automation platform must, by definition, be able to work with virtual machines in a private infrastructure as well as containers, which is why inside of Salt we've built extensive management of Docker containers as well as LXC containers extensive management capabilities for all the public clouds, but also private clouds, as well as management capabilities to manage your own private cloud. And this makes sense. It becomes easy because we're built on communication. We're built on remote execution capabilities. We're built on autonomic routines. We're built on configuration management. So layering cloud management and more complicated routines becomes an easy thing a viable thing, a plausible thing. And that brings us back to this concept of being able to manage and automate the full stack of a deployment. Just like before when we were talking about managing snowflakes and pets and cattle, you need to be able to manage the hardware all the way up through the virtual machines or the containers that are on it. So again, that is why I made SALT. So that I would be able to have a tool which in and of itself can manage every aspect of an infrastructure that is required, do it well, do it easily, and do it quickly. Thank you.